In cryptography, a block cipher is a deterministic algorithm operating on fixed-length groups of bits, called blocks, with an unvarying transformation that is specified by a symmetric key. Block ciphers are important elementary components in the design of many cryptographic protocols, and are widely used to implement encryption of bulk data. The modern design of block ciphers is based on the concept of an iterated product cipher. Product ciphers were suggested and analyzed by Claude Shannon in his seminal 1949 publication Communication Theory of Secrecy Systems as a means to effectively improve security by combining simple operations such as substitutions and permutations. Iterated product ciphers carry out encryption in multiple rounds, each of which uses a different subkey derived from the original key. One widespread implementation of such ciphers is called a Feistel network, named after Horst Feistel, and notably implemented in the day's cipher. Many other realizations of block ciphers, such as the AES, are classified as substitution permutation networks. The publication of the DES cipher by the U.S. National Bureau of Standards in 1977 was fundamental in the public understanding of modern block cipher design. In the same way, it influenced the academic development of cryptanalytic attacks. Both differential and linear cryptanalysis arose out of studies on the day's design. Today, there is a palette of attack techniques against which a block cipher must be secure, in addition to being robust against brute force attacks. Even a secure block cipher is suitable only for the encryption of a single block under a fixed key. A multitude of modes of operation have been designed to allow their repeated use in a secure way commonly to achieve the security goals of confidentiality and authenticity. However, block ciphers may also be used as building blocks in other cryptographic protocols, such as universal hash functions and pseudo-random number generators. Definition A block cipher consists of two paired algorithms, one for encryption e, and the other for decryption. Both algorithms accept two inputs an input block of size n bits and a key of size k bits, and both yield an n bit output block. The decryption algorithm D is defined to be the inverse function of encryption, i.e., D equals E minus 1. More formally, a block cipher is specified by an encryption function which takes as input a key k of bit length k, called the key size and a bit string p of length n, called the block size, and returns a string c of n bits. p is called the plain text, and c is termed the cipher text. For each k, the function e k is required to be an invertible mapping on 0, 1, n. The inverse for e is defined as a function taking a key k in a cipher text c to return a plain text value p, such that for example, a block cipher encryption algorithm might take a 128-bit block of plain text as input, and output a corresponding 128-bit block of cipher text. The exact transformation is controlled using a second input, the secret key. Decryption is similar. The decryption algorithm takes, in this example, a 128-bit block of cipher text together with the secret key, and a yields the original 128-bit block of plain text. For each key k, e k is a permutation over the set of input blocks. Each key selects one permutation from the possible set of design. Iterated block ciphers Most block cipher algorithms are classified as iterated block ciphers which means that they transform fixed size blocks of plain text into identical size blocks of cipher text via the repeated application of an invertible transformation known as the round function, with each iteration referred to as a round. Usually, the round function R takes different round keys key as second input, which are derived from the original key, whereas the plain text and the cipher text with R being the round number. Frequently, key whitening is used in addition to this. At the beginning and the end, the data is modified with key material. 
Given one of the standard iterated block cipher design schemes, it is fairly easy to construct a block cipher that is cryptographically secure, simply by using a large number of rounds. However, this will make the cipher inefficient. Thus, efficiency is the most important additional design criterion for professional ciphers. Further, a good block cipher is designed to avoid side-channel attacks, such as input-dependent memory accesses that might leak secret data via the cache state or the execution time. In addition, the cipher should be concise for small hardware and software implementations. Finally, the cipher should be easily cryptanalyzable, such that it can be shown to how many rounds the cipher needs to be reduced such that the existing cryptographic attacks would work and conversely, that the number of actual rounds is large enough to protect against him. Substitution permutation networks One important type of iterated block cipher known as a substitution permutation network takes a block of the plain text and the key as inputs. The nonlinear substitution stage mixes the key bits with those of the plain text, creating Shannon's confusion. The linear permutation stage then dissipates redundancies, creating diffusion. A substitution box substitutes a small block of input bits with another block of output bits. This substitution must be one-to-one -to, -one to ensure invertibility. A secure S-box will have the property that changing one input bit will change about half of the output bits on average, exhibiting what is known as the avalanche effect, i.e., it has the property that each output bit will depend on every input bit. A permutation box is a permutation of all the bits. It takes the outputs of all the S-boxes of one round, permutes the bits, and feeds them into the S-boxes of the next round. A good P-box has the property that the output bits of any S-box are distributed to as many S-box inputs as possible. At each round, the round key is combined using some group operation, typically XOR. Decryption is done by simply reversing the process. Feistel ciphers In a Feistel cipher, the block of plain text to be encrypted is split into two equal-sized halves. The round function is applied to one half, using a subkey, and then the output is exited with the other half. The two halves are then swapped. Let be the round function and let be the subkeys for the rounds respectively. Then the basic operation is as follows. Split the plain text block into two equal pieces, for each round, compute. Then the cipher text is. Decryption of a cipher text is accomplished by computing for. Then is the plain text again. One advantage of the Feistel model compared to a substitution permutation network is that the round function does not have to be invertible. Limassy ciphers The Limassy scheme offers security properties similar to those of the Feistel structure. It also shares its advantage that the round function does not have to be invertible. Another similarity is that it also splits the input block into two equal pieces. However, the round function is applied to the difference between the two, and the result is then added to both half blocks. Let be the round function and a half round function and let be the subkeys for the rounds respectively. Then the basic operation is as follows. Split the plain text block into two equal pieces, for each round, compute where and then the cipher text is. Decryption of a cipher text is accomplished by computing for where and then is the plain text again. Operations arcs add rotate XOR Many modern block ciphers and hashes are arcs algorithms. Their round function involves only three operations. Modular addition, rotation with fixed rotation amounts, and XOR. Examples include Salsa 20 and Speck and Blake. Many authors draw an arcs network, a kind of data flow diagram, to illustrate such a round function. These arcs operations are popular because they are relatively fast and cheap in hardware and software, and also because they run in constant time, and are therefore immune to timing attacks. The rotational cryptanalysis technique attempts to attack such round functions. Other operations Other operations often used in block ciphers include data-dependent rotations as in RC5 and RC6. 
a substitution box implemented as a lookup table as in data encryption standard and advanced encryption standard, a permutation box, and multiplication as in idea. Modes of operation. A block cipher by itself allows encryption only of a single data block of the cipher's block length. For a variable length message, the data must first be partitioned into separate cipher blocks. In the simplest case, known as the electronic code book mode, a message is first split into separate blocks of the cipher's block size, and then each block is encrypted and decrypted independently. However, such a naive method is generally insecure because equal plain text blocks will always generate equal cipher text blocks. So patterns in the plain text message become evident in the cipher text output. To overcome this limitation, several so-called block cipher modes of operation have been designed and specified in national recommendations such as NIST 800-38A and BSITR 02102, and international standards such as ISO, IEC 10116. The general concept is to use randomization of the plaintext data based on an additional input value, frequently called an initialization vector to create what is termed probabilistic encryption. In the popular cipher blockchaining mode, for encryption to be secure the initialization vector passed along with the plain text message must be a random or pseudo-random value, which is added in an exclusive or manner to the first plain text block before it is being encrypted. The resultant cipher text block is then used as the new initialization vector for the next plain text block. In the cipher feedback mode, which emulates a self-synchronizing stream cipher, the initialization vector is first encrypted and then added to the plain text block. The output feedback mode repeatedly encrypts the initialization vector to create a key stream for the emulation of a synchronous stream cipher. The newer counter mode similarly creates a key stream but has the advantage of only needing unique and not random values as initialization vectors. The needed randomness is derived internally by using the initialization vector as a block counter and encrypting this counter for each block. From a security theoretic point of view, modes of operation must provide what is known as semantic security. Informally, it means that given some ciphertext under an unknown key one cannot practically derive any information from the ciphertext over what one would have known without seeing the ciphertext. It has been shown that all of the modes discussed above, with the exception of the ECB mode, provide this property under so-called chosen plain text attacks. Padding. Some modes such as the CBC mode only operate on complete plain text blocks. Simply extending the last block of a message with zero bits is insufficient since it does not allow a receiver to easily distinguish messages that differ only in the amount of padding bits. More importantly, such a simple solution gives rise to very efficient padding oracle attacks. A suitable padding scheme is therefore needed to extend the last plain text block to the cipher's block size. While many popular schemes described in standards and in the literature have been shown to be vulnerable to padding oracle attacks, a solution which adds a one bit and then extends the last block with zero bits, standardized as padding method 2 in ISO, IEC 9797-1, has been proven secure against these attacks. Cryptanalysis Brute force attacks due to a block cipher's characteristic as an invertible function. Its output becomes distinguishable from a truly random output string over time due to the birthday attack. This property results in the cipher's security degrading quadratically, and needs to be taken into account when selecting a block size. There is a trade-off though as large block sizes can result in the algorithm becoming inefficient to operate. Earlier block ciphers such as the DES have typically selected a 64-bit block size, while newer designs such as the AES support block sizes of 128 bits or more, with some ciphers supporting a range of different block sizes. 
Differential cryptanalysis Linear cryptanalysis Linear cryptanalysis is a form of cryptanalysis based on finding affine approximations to the action of a cipher. Linear cryptanalysis is one of the two most widely used attacks on block ciphers, the other being differential cryptanalysis. The discovery is attributed to Mitsuru Matsui, who first applied the technique to the feel cipher. Integral cryptanalysis Integral cryptanalysis is a cryptanalytic attack that is particularly applicable to block ciphers based on substitution permutation networks. Unlike differential cryptanalysis, which uses pairs of chosen plain texts with a fixed XOR difference, Integral cryptanalysis uses sets or even multi-sets of chosen plain texts of which part is held constant and another part varies through all possibilities. For example, an attack might use 256 chosen plain texts that have all but eight of their bits the same, but all differ in those eight bits. Such a set necessarily has an XOR sum of zero, and the XOR sums of the corresponding sets of ciphertexts provide information about the cipher's operation. This contrast between the differences of pairs of texts and the sums of larger sets of texts inspired the name integral cryptanalysis, borrowing the terminology of calculus. Other techniques in addition to linear and differential cryptanalysis, there is a growing catalogue of attacks. Truncated differential cryptanalysis, partial differential cryptanalysis, integral cryptanalysis, which encompasses square and integral attacks. Slide attacks, boomerang attacks, the XSL attack, impossible differential cryptanalysis and algebraic attacks. For a new block cipher designed to have any credibility, it must demonstrate evidence of security against known attacks. Provable security. When a block cipher is used in a given mode of operation, the resulting algorithm should ideally be about as secure as the block cipher itself. ECB emphatically lacks this property. Regardless of how secure the underlying block cipher is, ECB mode can easily be attacked. On the other hand, CBC mode can be proven to be secure under the assumption that the underlying block cipher is likewise secure. Note, however, that making statements like this requires formal mathematical definitions for what it means for an encryption algorithm or a block cipher to be secure. This section describes two common notions for what properties a block cipher should have. Each corresponds to a mathematical model that can be used to prove properties of higher level algorithms, such as a CBC. This general approach to cryptography, proving higher level algorithms are secure under explicitly stated assumptions regarding their components, is known as provable security. Standard model informally. A block cipher is secure in the standard model if an attacker cannot tell the difference between the block cipher and a random permutation. To be a bit more precise, let E be an n-bit block cipher. We imagine the following game. The person running the game flips a coin. If the coin lands on heads, he chooses a random key k and defines the function f equals ek. If the coin lands on tails, he chooses a random permutation pi on the set of n bit strings and defines the function f equals pi. The attacker chooses an n bit string x and the person running the game tells him the value of f. Step 2 is repeated a total of q times. The attacker guesses how the coin landed. He wins if his guess is correct. The attacker, which we can model as an algorithm, is called an adversary. The function f is called an oracle. Note that an adversary can trivially ensure a 50% chance of winning simply by guessing at random. Therefore let p denote the probability that the adversary a wins this game against e, and define the advantage of a as 2 1 half. It follows that if a guesses randomly, its advantage will be 0. On the other hand, if a always wins, then its advantage is 1. The block cipher is a pseudo-random permutation if no adversary has an advantage significantly greater than 0. Given specified restrictions on Q and the adversary's running time, 
if in step 2 above adversaries have the option of learning F-1 instead of F then E is a strong PRP. An adversary is non-adaptive if it chooses all Q values for X before the game begins. These definitions have proven useful for analyzing various modes of operation. For example, one can define a similar game for measuring the security of a block cipher-based encryption algorithm, and then try to show that the probability of an adversary winning this new game is not much more than P for some A. Equivalently, if P is small for all relevant A, then no attacker has a significant probability of winning the new game. This formalizes the idea that the higher-level algorithm inherits the block cipher's security. Ideal cipher model practical evaluation Block ciphers may be evaluated according to multiple criteria in practice. Common factors include key parameters, such as its key size and block size, both which provide an upper bound on the security of the cipher. The estimated security level, which is based on the confidence gained in the block cipher design after it has largely withstood major efforts in cryptanalysis over time. The design's mathematical soundness, and the existence of practical or certificational attacks. The cipher's complexity and its suitability for implementation in hardware or software. Hardware implementations may measure the complexity in terms of gate count or energy consumption, which are important parameters for resource-constrained devices. The cipher's performance in terms of processing throughput on various platforms, including its memory requirements. The cost of the cipher, which refers to licensing requirements that may apply due to intellectual property rights. The flexibility of the cipher, which includes its ability to support multiple key sizes and block lengths. 